The most important thing was that when you stand on a stage, when you're projected onto a motion picture screen, the things that you do and the things that you say will have an impact on those people's lives. And w with that comes a sense of responsibility. If you wait for a director to tell you what to do, then you've lost. That it's not the director's responsibility, it's ours as an artist that, that, that in this profession we are artists. Stanley Kubrick as an independent filmmaker is probably the most independent, independent filmmaker ever to get behind a motion picture camera. I, I can honestly say my one claim to glory is that I should be in the Guinness Book of Records because nobody's watched his films, every one of them, as many times as I have. Robert Altman was the first person to say it, and Stanley Kubrick said it, Alan Parker said it, Alan Pakula said it, that 90% of making a movie is casting the right actors, you know, finding the right people to tell the stories. I, my profession, uh, that's an interesting question. I think it was my history teacher said that people that profess to be something are not as good as amateurs because amateurs uh, have a natural ability and a natural inclination. So uh, I'm, so I'm Matthew Modine and I'm an amateur. I'm the youngest of seven children and as you say, my father was a drive-in theater manager. We did have some theaters when he got transferred to Utah. Uh, we had a, a, a beautiful theater called The Lyric. It, it didn't see, seem to be something that was far away from me, um, but, but I did go to see movies and thought that of them as kind of documentary films, not, not uh, theatrical productions of fantasy. So when I saw Sean Connery in uh, James Bond, uh, he was James Bond. And then I saw him in The Man Who Would Be King. And, and then I began to realize that there was something about this profession of, of being in the movies that was different than what my imagination had led me to believe. And then I saw a documentary film about the making of Oliver. Mark Lester was learning to sing and dance with the other children. That's a profession. That's something that people people do, you know, that they, uh, they learn to sing and dance and then they act in front of the camera. And I said, well, that, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, the interesting thing apart about this story is when I was about 10 years old, I told my aunt, Alice, she started studying ballet and acting with members of the group theater. Subsequently, she didn't become a ballerina or a, uh, or a, a successful working actress, but she never lost her passion for the arts. So when I told her when I was about 10 or 11 years old that I was considering being an actor, she took me to a used bookstore here in Los Angeles and bought me a book uh, by Konstantin Stanislavski called An Actor Prepares. Uh, of course, I, I couldn't pronounce uh, Konstantin Stanislavski uh, and I had no idea what the contents of that book were about, but I tried. I tried to read and I kept that book with me. And when I was 18 years old and I moved to New York City to uh, study acting, I had that book with me and I became a chef at a restaurant and I'd hear the waiters talking about Ibsen and Chekhov and Tennessee Williams and Eugene O'Neill and Arthur Miller. And, and I, I realized that I wanted to go into a profession that I didn't know anything about. So I asked one of the, the waiters who was an actor, where could I learn about those people? And he said, you should go to Stella Adler. She'd really like you. I, I went in to meet her and she said, if you've come here for me to teach you how to be a movie star, you should turn around and leave right now. I don't teach that. If I'm lucky, I'll teach you to be a human being. Little did she know or little did I know that that book would lead me to somehow magically to this woman, Stella Adler, who had studied with Konstantin Stanislavski, was a student of, of his. I just thought it was a magical way of, of my aunt uh, opening the door to something that would happen uh, eight years on in my life. Hey, listen, you're no doctor, are you? I just want to make sure he doesn't have to go to the infirmary, then I'll leave you alone. I know what Martin needs. Yeah, I'll bet you do. While I was studying with Stella, I auditioned, and you weren't supposed to do that. I, but I felt I didn't have time. You know, I, I, I was in New York City with a limited amount of money. I had no support from my family. That the, the idea of moving to New York City to become an actor was the most absurd idea. My father was terrified that, that something horrible was going to happen to me in New York. I, I took 
the, the lessons that I was learning in class and applied them to real life situations with auditions. And then I, I had a call to go to meet Robert Altman to audition. I auditioned at least seven times and he had me play different roles. It, and it was lots of different actors that I read with. And then finally I said to Bob, I say, you know, I can't do this anymore, man. I, 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 it's, it's making me sick to my stomach that, uh, you know, he goes, don't worry, you're going to be in the movie. And I said, yeah, what am I going to be, an extra, like a background performer? He goes, no, no, you're going to play Billy. And then I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm going to be in a Robert Altman movie. And it was an extraordinary experience uh, to be working with Robert Altman on s such a powerful play that was made into a film. I, I realized that a film director is like a conductor that Robert Altman was the first person to say it, and Stanley Kubrick said it, that 90% of making a movie is casting the right actors, you know, finding the right people to tell the stories. That my job is, is if I play the, the violin, is not for the conductor to tell me to, how to interpret this piece of music. It's my job to go home and practice and learn what Beethoven was trying to say, what he was trying to make the audience feel when they listen to his music. A conductor's job is to assemble those people in the orchestra as the conductor to say, you know, now a little bit softer, a little bit louder, now, you know, and, and to conduct the, 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 the orchestra into a symphony. That's what Robert Altman was. He was a great conductor. There was a time when I was on the set and I had a big monologue and so every night I was going home and pouring over the script and every day he said we'll talk about it tomorrow, we'll talk about it tomorrow and Friday comes and I said Bob could I talk to you about this scene? He goes okay just hold on a second. He goes what are you going to do in the scene? I mean wh where are you going to be? What, what, what are you physically doing in the scene? And I said well I imagine that I'm in my bunk and I'm telling the story and, and maybe some point I, I get up and I put my boot, boots on or something. And he goes, okay, good. He goes, uh, uh, Lichtenstein, Mitchell, wh what are you going to do? If Modine does that, what, what are you going to do? And Pierre Mignot was this, the cinematographer. He said, Pierre, how do you want to shoot it? And he goes, okay. He goes, okay, let's start on Modine. I got to make a phone call. I'll be right back. I said, Bob, could I talk to you? He goes, I'll be right back. And he comes back and he goes, okay, let's shoot. And I was gutted. I, w I wanted to start crying because I, uh, you know, I never got the chance to speak to Bob about the scene. And he came over and he sat down on the bunk with me. And he said, you see, kid, if I was interested in my interpretation of the role, I would have played the part. He goes, I hired you because I think you're a terrific actor and it's your responsibility to interpret the role. And you did a great job. And it just was an affirmation and a reaffirmation of what Stella Adler had said, that it's not the director's job to tell you how to interpret a role. That's your responsibility. You create the foundation for that point that, that you're bringing to life in that moment. Well, I was having breakfast with David Alan Greer at a restaurant that used to be on Sunset called uh, The Source. It was famous, you know, the movie Annie Hall. So we were laughing and having breakfast talking about Woody Allen and there was somebody that was sitting there and it appeared to me that he was looking at me saying, you know, fuck you. And I said to David, I said, there's a guy sitting over there. Either he's practicing a monologue or he's got Tourette's, but he's clearly looking at me saying, fuck you. And David looks over his shoulder. He goes, oh, he says, that's Val Kilmer. He's a really nice guy. David had worked with him on uh, Top Secret. And he, he told me to come over. I say, how you doing? My name's Matthew. He goes, yeah, I know who you are. I'm sick of you. He said, I'm just sick of you because you had gotten Vision Quest and Streamers and Mrs. Soful, and now you're doing Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket. And I said, look, I'm not gonna apologize for the work that I've done because clearly these were all parts that Val may have auditioned for and, and could have been right for. Val's a wonderful actor, a very nice man. But I said, but you don't have to worry about Full Metal Jacket because I didn't audition. Clearly you auditioned and you think that I've got the part, but I'm telling you, I didn't audition. As I, as I finished talking to him, I ran out to the payphone and put a bunch of quarters in and called my manager in New York City. And I said, uh, this actor just told me that, that I'm doing Stanley Kubrick's movie. Do you know anything about it? And he said, no, I don't know anything about it. I said, well, I know he makes his movies with Warner Brothers so we could get 
uh, Warner Brothers and Harold Becker to send Vision Quest to him. And Alan Parker is in London editing Birdie, and I could ask Alan to send over some scenes, you know, from, from the film. I don't know, it felt like six weeks, eight weeks later, I received a script through my mail slot in New York with this tremendously humble letter from Stanley Kubrick saying, my name is Stanley Kubrick, I'm a film director, this is a project that I'm working on. I wonder if you'd consider being in my film. Stanley told me to deliver a script to Matthew. And I, he, he was living on the King's Road in Chelsea uh, at the time, uh. his first house. And we talked for a while in the house. And you, and you asked me, he said, Stanley's not sort of cruel to his actors, is he? And I said, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> now, you would never imagine that Stanley Kubrick would write a letter with such great humility, that uh, introducing himself as a film director, but that tells you a lot about who Stanley Kubrick is. I read the script, which didn't read like a script. It wasn't formatted like a, a typical motion picture script. It read more like an idea for a screenplay. And I, as I read it, I wasn't sure which part, because he didn't say in his letter what part I was reading for. And I thought at the beginning, he must want me to play Private Pile because he saw Birdie. As I continued reading, I thought, oh, geez, I wonder if he wants me to play Private Joker. That would be awesome. That's such a great role. And the script always changed. It was never the same. Something could change inside the scene from the rehearsal that we were doing. That would be memorialized in the script. But once you started working on that, then it would suggest something else. So Stanley was never afraid. He never used storyboards from every film I know uh, from 2001 onwards. I don't know if he used them before that. I don't think Maybe so. Maybe on Spartacus for Maybe the battles. Maybe on Spartacus he, he probably would have done, yeah. You know, it was always growing and growing. And I can honestly say that what you started out with as a script at the beginning <laughs> it yeah. bore no relation to it by the time you plow your way through it and it developed and blossomed. So I'm having dinner with Alan Parker and he goes, you know, Stanley Kubrick's a real prick. And I said, what are you, what are you talking about? He said, I sent him those scenes from Birdie and the guy never even sent me a note back to say thank you. And I said, well, yeah, Alan, he's, Stanley's directing a movie. He's, he's in pre-production. I'm sure he's gonna write you a letter. He just hasn't had time. And so I see Stanley and I say, Stanley, you know, you should write a note and say thank you to Alan Parker. Uh, for, for sending you those scenes. And he goes, Alan Parker's a prick. He goes, he sent me a bunch of scenes that all it did was demonstrate that you knew how to memorize lines and yell. And he said, lucky for you at the end of the scene where you were screaming and yelling, there was a, some, a quiet scene with you. He said it was that. He said it was that quiet bit of acting was why I hired you because it was interesting to look at you and look inside of your mind and see you. It was an important lesson for me because if I was gonna pick a scene from a movie to send to a director, I'd pick something that was very dramatic and loud and noisy and showing, you know, showing your, you know, your muscles. It was a quiet bit of acting, of listening to what's going on inside of your brain that, that made Stanley interested in, in me for the role of, of uh, Private Joker. Does this mean that Anne Margaret's not coming? <laughs> Joker, I, I want you to get straight up to Fubai. Captain January will need all his people. Yes, sir. You know, I've read a lot of books about the indoctrination that, that young men go through, young women now today also, in the process of stripping away individuality so that you work together as a unit. It's an important part of the process so that you become part of a group of a unit that you have each other's back. I think that what I was imagining when Joker, when that was going to happen to Joker, that he begrudgingly was giving up his individuality to do something that he wasn't sure of why he had done it. So Joker, you know, in, in, at that time, there was a, a draft in the United States. So you have to imagine, why did Joker join the Marines? You know, what was he looking for? You know, did he want to be a combat correspondent? Was he somebody who was a fan of Ernest Hemingway? And you know, that in order for Ernest Hemingway to write the great American novel, he felt that he had to go and experience something and live something. I had read Michael Hare's book, Dispatches, Errol Flynn's son. There was a story about uh, in, in his book, but Flynn, 
had decided that the photographs and the stories that were being told about America's involvement in Vietnam were always from this perspective. So he thought what would be interesting would be to go on the Vietnamese side and see the Americans coming so that he could tell that, you know, show that perspective of what it was like to be on that side. You know, that, there, those were kind of things that I thought were exciting and, and influential in my portrayal of, uh, of Private Joker. The Marine Corps does not want robots. The Marine Corps wants killers. The Marine Corps wants to build indestructible men, men without fear. Stanley's one of the most misunderstood film directors in the history of cinema. Stanley was a completely collaborative uh, director, uh, which is contrary to what so many people think. They think that he was fascist on his, on his set and demanding everything be done uh, a certain way. And the thing that's truthful ab about Stanley is that he expected and demanded the best from every single person that was working on the set. On Stanley Kubrick productions, a call sheet was a suggestion for what we might do tomorrow. It was certainly by no means what you were going to accomplish. We may shoot something completely different. You can't isolate any one of the parts of the process that go into what you see as the finished thing. You know, one thing bounces off another and bounces off another and there's a growth in, you know, what it is you're doing. And, and what it is he's doing, what he's finding because of what you're doing. And yeah. it was a really symbiotic relationship you had on, you know, with Stanley as an actor. I, I've never worked with anybody in television or, or film that worked for me as closely as you work with a stage director. You find things in, a, in, a, in such a different way and it's not like you have to come with any preconceived ideas because it's better if you don't. Really, I think actors learn that quite quickly when they were, you know, after the first meeting with Stanley. <laughs> we had probably filmed at that point for about six weeks, and I don't believe that we accomplished anything that was on the call sheet. And I started feeling, as w one does because of ego, that it must be me. I must be failing Stanley. I must not know what it is that I'm doing. I got very emotional and I said, you know, Stanley, I just, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. I feel like I don't know how to portray this character. And he said, look, man, he said that I, I don't want you to play anything. I just want you to be yourself. One of the mistakes that people make in their lives, whether they're film directors or writers or actors or, or any, in most professions, is trying to be somebody else. That the most difficult thing in life is to understand who you are, be comfortable who you are, and allow yourself to be who you are. So, so the best direction that I received from Stanley Kubrick was uh, one of the first shots in the movie that we shot was me walking through the palm trees and Stanley came over and he said, act scared. Now that may sound simplistic, but it's actually perfect direction. And I chose the way I wanted to be scared. What I wanted to do was be able to splash blood on the audience so that we could all feel the responsibility of what had happened to not just Joker, but Joker being emblematic and representing every young man or young woman who goes to fight in a war and has to take another person's life, that I wanted them to feel the responsibility of pulling the trigger, to see what, what people call the thousand yard stare. I, I believe that Stanley Kubrick and I accomplished that in that moment uh, at the end of Full Metal Jacket. I've seen scenes from the 4K version and it's like I never saw the movie, that this 4K remastering of the film. So what Leon Vitale uh, has been able to do by going in frame by frame by frame from the, from the film negative of Full Metal Jacket is to pull out information that uh, when you're making a 35 millimeter print and it's going through the machine, uh, the machine's not able to, to capture the resolution. You know, whenever we did a a video release, every single territory, you know, they'd never, it never happened to them before where we rejected their VHSs, you know, as what they were going to release. And because then of the course, quality was too the quality poor. was so bad, you know. You know, if you had to subtitle them, 
then you'd have to go through and subtitle and check the subtitles, check them against the subtitle list. It went on and on and on. Doing a 4K remastering, digital transfer of the film is, is what, what Leon's able to do. And because he worked with Stanley Kubrick for 40 years, Leon was the only person who understands Stanley's library, who understands the uh, passion of Stanley Kubrick. Which one, which one of, the, of all the films is the most, for you, rewatchable? If you had to pick oh. one. I, I can't say it because every time I do a, you know, a transfer, <laughs> I mean, I'm into it as it is. You it's, fall in love it's with like, that one. Yeah, it's like asking me what's my favorite Beatles album. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> mm. He's always asking himself, what would Stanley do? And what would Stanley accept, you know? And he won't allow something to be done that doesn't reach those standards. I think it's unfortunate that, that had Stanley still been alive now and with Netflix, I think that he could have realized the dream of, of telling a, a 15 hour story or a, or a 100 hour story, a Game of Thrones length story about Napoleon's uh, life. I mean, people kind of peg him into this, you know, he would have been, he would have eschewed working in digital and in film, you know, and shooting digital film. It's, it's not. It's not true. I mean, what he would have done is worked in the medium and sort of got people to do it or do it so that he could manipulate it the way he wanted. And then, you know, he would have, he would have done it. He would have done it. And it was the same, it would have been the same with drones. It would have been the same with anything. You know, every time we got a new color stock, we were having to change ways of thinking about lighting and. And, you know, if it was good, he loved it. The business has changed so much since I came into it. There, there, there wasn't streaming, you know, there wasn't YouTube. There, uh, there was theater, there was television and movies. There is no greater uh, tool for an actor than working in live theater, you know, uh, reading plays. Um, the, the experience that you get from working in a theater and performing for a live audience, there's nothing better to teach you how to capture an audience and be able to hold their attention. That's another thing that for young actors that might be watching. You must never repeat something that you don't understand what you're talking about. So if, if you're talking about somebody's spine and, and, and the, the brain and nervous system, you better go do your homework and have an understanding of what it is that you're talking about. Otherwise, the things that you say are, are gonna sound hollow and empty, that you have to have an understanding of what it is that you're talking about. Otherwise, you're just repeating words. What's the loudest note in music? And people always try to guess, you know, that's it. E, it's a this, it's that, and it's, it's not, it's silence. That, you know, in bum 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 bum, bum 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 bum, you know, it's, it's that silence in between those two phrases that creates the anticipation of what's going to come next. That when you're acting, you think of yourself as a blank canvas and what is the thing that you're going to put? Because every gesture that you make, every pause that you take, the, if you speak loudly, if you speak softly, all of those things mean something. The really good actors, you know, that, that I really love, they don't do things haphazardly. They move because there's a reason to move. Think of it as a game of chess, you know. If you just move your pieces around, you're probably not going to be very successful at the game. But if you move strategically and move with two moves in your mind about what you're going to do next, of how I'm going to retaliate should you move a certain way, uh, then, you, then you start to understand the craft of acting. Then you start to understand the craft of motion picture making and film editing and, uh, you know, and what a musical score can do to those things when they're all put together.